On today's episode, Walmart went all B-dubs and altered the race. We talk communism, plus a new segment with voicemails. Welcome back to Break Hard. I'm Matt. Pretty eventful weekend in Atlanta this weekend for the NASCAR Cup Series and the Xfinity Series. We'll get to that in a moment. Maybe we'll also touch on the World 100 as well as the Tusky 50 for the High Limit Series. New segment is coming up this week, a little bit after the race recaps when we talk about what happened real quick. A new voicemail segment. So if you follow me on Twitter, at Break Hard Blog, TikTok, or even on here, you saw in the most recent videos and post to TikTok that I have a phone number. You can call me at and leave a voicemail. Some people text me as well. Give me your thoughts on the race. Um questions you have in general. So you can call me 513-445-9809. Let me know what your thoughts are, what questions you have, and I'll include them next week in that video. If you want to wait until after the races this weekend at Watkins Glen, Baku, or even in Nashville for the IndyCar Championship finale, let me know. So we'll get to that in a little bit, but we're starting off with the NASCAR Cup Series race and the fact that the Walton family apparently just hates NASCAR. So that maybe isn't necessarily true. If you were watching the race with like 11 laps to go, a Walmart sign fell down on the front stretch in Atlanta, and it brought out a caution. And you're like, why is there a caution coming out? And they show a piece of debris, and it is, what, about a six-foot-long Walmart sign that's laying in the middle of the front stretch? That shouldn't be happening. I mean, they went all B-dubs here, right? You see the commercials, they're like, oh, let's alter the game here, send it to overtime, have a gust of wind. We had a pretty good battle going there between Ty Gibbs, Daniel Suarez, Ross Chastain, uh, Joey Logano, and even Ryan Blaney was trying to get back up into the mix there. And we... Got it taken away from us because of this Walmart sign falling down. Marcus Smith and his team need to get stronger zip ties or whatever they use to hold those signs in the place need to be buttoned up a little bit more. Or, hey, maybe we don't even have signs that hang over the actual racetrack. There's enough branding around the entire racetrack. We're aware if Walmart has a presence there or just paint it on the wall instead of having them hang over. They're also hanging over the entry to turn three on the backstretch. I get it from a camera angle. You have that sign up there. It's not necessary, especially when it alters a race. Hate to see that. Sam Walton just laughing his ass off. I, aside from the fact that the Walton family manipulated the end of that race, this race had a lot of playoff implications to it, even though we never really had that big wreck that we've you know come to expect at these drafting style tracks. The first big big incident for the playoffs happened early on in the race in stage one when Kyle Larson towards the end of stage one actually Kyle Larson got loose down in turn two went to catch it and just went right back into the wall head on heavy hit for for Larson and then gets tagged by Chase Briscoe who went sailing into the smoke like he was back in Arca clobbered the five car broke the pedals on the 14 car those are two playoff guys. Briscoe's now minus 20 from the cutoff line. Larson came into the day as a points leader uh, plus 38 over the cut line he is now only plus 15 as he leaves uh, it leaves Atlanta, Dave Burns made a point to let Larson know that he came in with a lot of playoff points, but his crash was affecting it, to which Larson said, obviously, and just walked away. Very bizarre um, interaction between the two of, of them. Briscoe, bad day for him. He says he's in a must win. He's not necessarily in a must win. He just needs to really capitalize on stage points over the next two weekends and not have a bad Watkins Glen at that. And if he does have a bad Watkins Glen, then he really is in a must win. You also had another big incident with Chris Buescher, who basically went full Kyle Larson, got loose off a of turn two, same way, went to catch it back off into the wall, tags the 12 car of Ryan Blaney, who then had Martin Truex Jr. to help catch him. A lot like we saw last week in Darlington, where Truex took out Blaney on lap two, and this was the turnaround where Blaney ends up giving uh, Truex most of the damage, ruins Truex's day. He's a playoff driver. Blaney, of course, is a playoff driver. Blaney was able to rebound from that incident and still record a second place finish on the day for Truex. Bad day all around for him. He said, yeah, you guys fixed it 10%. We're still 80% effed. Never want to be 80% effed. Never want to be 100% effed. 80% effed, still actually bad as well. And then at the end of the race, uh, coming to the checkered flag, we had another incident, which involved Harrison Burton, Bubba Walls, and Denny Hamlin. Obviously, two of those playoff drivers. Hamlin came into the day, uh, obviously, into the weekend. And I don't know if the charter discussions distracted him or what, but they were bad in qualifying, two seconds off the pace, obviously had an engine issue there. Started in the back, ran in the 30s and the backside of the 20s all day. It all and Their goal was to minimize points damage, and they end up maximizing points damage by getting caught up in the incident at the end of the day. He is now only plus two points over the cutoff line. Really probably wishes that TRD didn't mess up sending his engine uh, back to Costa Mesa before NASCAR could tear it down and got him that points penalty because if he didn't get those 10 playoff points taken away, he would be plus 12 over the playoff cutoff line right now, feeling a little bit better 
about himself. He's going to Watkins Glen, where he does have a win, not in the next gen era, but does have a win at that track. And then Bristol, where he, of course, has been uh, very, very strong. One of the last two races there. So I'm not worried about Denny Hamlin quite yet, but man, they are not making it easy for themselves. Harrison Burton, I don't think anybody really had him advancing past the first round, and he pinballed his way down the backstretch a few laps before his wreck, and he decided and got into Noah Grax and not decided to dump him, but, you know, got into him, cause an incident there. But overall, this race was fine. I gave it an 80 on my race uh, review. Was it a good race? It was okay. As this track continues to wear out, it has certainly started to race a lot like a late 90s, early 2000s super speedway. They talked about that on the broadcast as well. You need a lot of momentum to make passes. The leader can really control things unless you have a huge push coming from uh, behind. We saw that happen on that late race restart when Logano was able to get out in front and Suarez was trying to get pushed by the one of Chastain. Chastain just really didn't have, he couldn't stay tucked up behind him. He kept losing the front end of that race car. And then Chastain gets sent into the wall down the backstretch by Chase Elliott, who on the last lap in Atlanta just loves to put <laughs> put his Chevy teammates into the wall there. Corey LaJoy and then Ross Chastain obviously didn't do it on purpose. But overall, the race was fine. It was... Um, I'm interested to see how this racetrack is going to keep racing as it uh, ages on. Logano obviously wins the race, locks himself into the next round of the playoffs. Big time win for him. Second win of the year. Obviously, he won uh, at Nashville uh, back in the summertime. And now we'll see even number years for Joey Logano. He puts himself into the championship for 16, 18, 20, 22. Will it be happening in 2024? I know Jeff Gluck hates that talk, but and there's a big enough sample size now that we can kind of determined that there is a trend, in fact, with even numbered years. So we'll see how he does. Uh, Austin Sendrick had a big day, plus 27 over the cutoff line. Now he had a uh, ton of stage points, won a stage from second to stage, and then got a 10th place finish. That's big time for him. Heads to a road course where you expect him to be pretty good at once again. And then to Bristol, which will be obviously a bit of a wild card for, for him in that situation. Uh, Suarez had a great points day as well, as did Alex Bowman. All the rumor and talks about him potentially being out of his ride. Uh, he looked strong all day. Average running position of P5, finished P5 on the day. Uh, definitely the best Hendrick car out there on Sunday. Moving on to the Xfinity Series race. The Xfinity Series continues to use the wrong package in Atlanta. If you're going to run this super speedway style racetrack in Atlanta, run the full super speedway package. And the Xfinity Series just does not do that. And it creates for an uh, race. It's not even that good. I'd say that race is probably like a 67. It just wasn't very, inter wasn't very entertaining and it's hard to make moves, and just not a lot was going on there. It was a lot of follow the leader, and obviously the top line is the preferred line there. We had the Corey Heim bit of controversy at the end of the race when he didn't push his Toyota teammate in Chandler Smith. Obviously, there's some deep-rooted hatred between Corey Heim and Joe Gibbs Racing. The two will never work together, even though Heim is the number one Toyota prospect. Uh, so why would he push Chandler Smith, who's probably not even going to be in a Toyota next year? He decided he wanted to go for the win, which he absolutely should. He's a racing driver. He's there to win the race. He's not there to push Chandler Smith across the start-finish line for the win. Same way Parker Retzloff a couple weeks ago in Daytona for the cup race is there to win the race. He's not there to push Kyle Busch uh, to the win. So Corey Heim did the right thing. I know some people were upset with him about it on the Internet. I'll never understand that. Chandler Smith got out and had a big fat diaper full of uh, of complaining that, you know, he didn't get a push for Corey Heim. Keep in mind, back in the springtime, he pushed the 21 and didn't help out his Toyota teammates. So, uh, yeah, obviously, when it goes against you, that's when you're going to start uh, whining and crying. So Chandler, we'll see what his future holds um, in, in the Xfinity Series or where he ends up at next season. But Austin Hill, once again, picks up what his seventh drafting track win uh, for RCR. Guy's just really good. As much as I don't want to like Austin Hill, when it comes to a drafting track, he's just that good. Um and hey, if he wants to keep hanging out in the Xfinity Series and winning those races, uh, he certainly is going to be able to do that. I would be interested to see him run uh, like the, all of the drafting races in the Cup Series and just kind of see if he can replicate, uh, you know, that same sort of magic up at the Cup level. New segment time. It is the Power Hour voicemail segment. It's not actually going to be an hour. We only had a few people call in this week, but hey, next week, call in. Let me know what you think about what happens at Watkins Glen, uh, F1, IndyCar. If you have general questions, I'll include them in the uh, show. Maybe I'll just end up becoming the break hard show with a big voicemail segment at that. But starting off this week, we have Bradley in Ohio. What's going on, break hard? It's Bradley from Ohio. 
I gotta ask, if you had to pick today your final four and champion, who would it be? Thanks, man. All right, thanks, Bradley, for calling in. The question is, if you're going to pick your final four, who would it be? Um, right now, I'm still going with Kyle Larson, Christopher Bell, Tyler Reddick, and, hey, I'm going to pick Joey Logano because it's an even number year. I didn't have that much faith in him, but he goes ahead and locks himself into the next round already, so I'm going to pick him for now. If it's not him, then it'll definitely be Ryan Blaney, my champion coming out of this. I'm still siding with it's a toss up between Christopher Bell and Kyle Larson for me right now. I want to go with Christopher Bell because he was lights out there in the spring, have a ton of confidence in him uh, going back, assuming they don't have break issues again, like they did last year. But thanks for the call, Bradley. All right. Next up is John from Florida, a regular Florida man calling in. Hi, Matt. This is John from Florida. I was wondering what the deal is with the uh, race manipulation rule with Toyota wanting Toyota drivers to push Toyotas and Ford doing the same at Daytona recently. How that's okay with NASCAR, but Spengate wasn't when that was race manipulation too. It seems like wanting manufacturers to have their drivers work with others in the same manufacturer fold. That sounds like race manipulation to me too. So thanks. Okay, yeah. So what John is asking there is when we go to these drafting tracks, there's a ton of talk about manufacturers only wanting their cars to work with their cars. So Chevy's only work with Chevy's, Toyota's with Toyota's, Ford's with Ford's. And we've had a lot of talk, obviously, now with, you know, the Corey Heim thing where he didn't push a Toyota uh, back at Daytona in the Cup Series where uh, Parker Retzloff didn't push Kyle Busch because the Chevy pushing a Chevy or, you know, didn't bail on the 21 there to ensure that Kyle Busch could win whatever avenue they really wanted him to take there. And then he also says how is that not race manipulation compared to like what Spingate was if you remember what Richard or uh, Michael Walter racing rather did at Richard Childress racing also involved in an incident in that same race that gets pushed under the rug a lot but uh, Michael Walter racing did back at Richmond in what was that 2013 uh, when they they had a uh, Boyer intentionally spin out there Brett Griffin is your arm getting a little itchy there uh, Clint so I think there's a clear um clear difference in that it's not that so the race manipulation that happened in Spingate the team clearly asked for a caution to come out that's manipulating the race that ends up changing the entire running order in terms of you know asking your drivers to work with your drivers it's not necessarily race manipulation it's a request if they were like you know hey Kyle Busch is leading I want you to drop back and what you what I think kind of leads to this is the talk of like the Parker Retzloff thing. Hey, why didn't you bail on the 21? Why didn't you bail on your race to help out the eight car? If, you know, Parker Retzloff was leading that race, pulls over and then just lets Kyle Busch lead or and win. I think that there's some, you know, some grounds there to talk about race manipulation. Unfortunately, we haven't seen that or I guess rather fortunately, we haven't seen that happen yet. So a lot of this is just like, you know, hypothetically speaking, I think if you ever did see that, you would have NASCAR question them. I mean, heck, at the Roval, what, two years ago when Cole Custer dropped back um, going into that backstretch chicane to allow Chase Briscoe to try to advance on in the playoffs, NASCAR penalized them for that because that's race manipulation. You were not racing at 100 uh, percent right now. Asking them to work with their manufacturer teammates isn't race manipulation in a sense if they were pulling over to, you know, uh, essentially alter the finish of a race that might be grounds for, but it's, uh, it's one of those things that's going to be, you know, a difficult road to go down. So right now I don't think it's race manipulation. I understand where you're coming from, but I'm not ready to take that step yet. The same way that spin gate was certainly race manipulation. All right, next we got Jacob from Ohio. Hi there. This is Jacob from Akron, Ohio. Just tell you about the race. It was a pretty good race. It was a good race. Switching gears and stuff. I got a question about Denny Hamlin. Now, everybody on the charter agreement, everybody signed for it and stuff, except for 2311, like Denny Hamlin. I got a question that, do you think Denny Hamlin will file either a lawsuit or antitrust lawsuit to block the charter agreement deal to make it that he wants it to be unanimous instead of majority? Can you answer that on on any time on any episode? Thanks. Bye. Now, I have thought about this a lot. If, if 2311 Racing will, in fact, sue NASCAR and bring up a lawsuit. 
And I'm really interested to see what exactly they would go after NASCAR for, because NASCAR is still a private company. They're not saying that you have to be a part of it. If you don't like the rules, you don't have to play the game. So they're not forcing anyone to be here. One NASCAR uh, owner who absolutely had to be Richard Childress, if you think about it, told Jordan Bianchi from The Athletic, uh, he said that NASCAR, he compared NASCAR to a communist regime, which tells me that they just don't know what communism is. But there's certainly some unhappy unhappy people there that sign deals. In 2311's case, they want an equity share of NASCAR. They're not going to get that. And they're not going to get that even if they go to sue NASCAR um, for... I guess what they believe would be their fair share. Like I said, there's a private company and NASCAR, much like the NFL has been great about keeping things out of the court system. That way they don't have to open up their books. Nobody's saying that you have to compete in NASCAR and 2311 racing is aware of that, but they want to make sure that their rights are protected and, and that they have access to their IP and everything else that goes into that. Now, if that's where they want to go. Sure. The problem with the antitrust portion of this is the fact that 13 of the 15 teams did sign up for it. So it's not like you're banding together to go after NASCAR. The The banding together broke off. Now you just have 2311 Racing and Front Row together, assuming assuming that they're working you know hand in hand with this. Meanwhile, the other 13 teams went ahead and just signed the deal and are taking what was offered to them. So can they? Yes. Will they? remains up in the air. There is a stipulation when you participate in NASCAR that you will not litigate against NASCAR. Obviously, if they have their charters taken away from them, then that opens things up, right? Because now they're not necessarily a part of NASCAR anymore. They can still compete even if they don't have charters. They can still show up and race. I don't think NASCAR can block them from doing that, especially if they meet all the parameters. That could be a separate you know, lawsuit if they wanted to go that direction. But for right now, I'm struggling to see what exactly they would go after where a judge would be like, yes, we're going to advance this on to a trial stage at that because I just don't think that there's enough in any little segment like segment that they can possibly think of where they can get it to that point at the moment. Unless, of course, they're taking a much different approach than where my brain is at, then we'll have to wait and see. All right, thank you for the calls this week. Hopefully we get a few more next week when we can talk uh, about more things that are happening, whether that be charters, on-track stuff. Also got a couple text messages. One person asked, is this really break hard? <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, another person uh, requested that I cover more dirt racing. Uh, yeah, if people want more dirt racing coverage, I'll absolutely do that. I think guys like Dirt Tracker do a really good job. Um, but yeah, if you want me to comment on more dirt stuff and that's something people are looking for, then absolutely. I'll I'll start talking a little bit more dirt here. In fact, I watched the World 100 on Saturday night. I was double TV in it, had the quad box for football games up, had World 100 over here on the other um, TV. I actually watched the high limit race first. Shout out Rico Abreu, big time win for he and that number 24 team uh, at the Tusky 50. Then switch over to World 100. Bobby Pierce once again picks up another crown jewel uh, a win. What he won the North South he won uh, the Prairie Dirt Classic. He's now won the World 100. Huge day for him. Uh, overall, that race was really solid. I thought Jonathan Davenport, when he took the lead, I was like, oh, man, he's going to start sailing off. And Bobby Pierce even alluded to that in his post-race interview where he's like, I saw the 49 get the lead and was like, oh, this might be a long night. But that 32 car was absolutely hooked up, ripping the top, and uh, managed to take another victory. Banner year for for Bobby Pierce and that number 32 team. Uh, they did, had a great tribute for Scott Bloomquist before the race, and um, even after the race, everybody was talking about him. Overall, I like that race a lot. Dirt late models aren't necessarily the biggest thing that I get into, but I'll always watch the crown jewels, especially when the ones that are on flow are on because I'm not paying for dirt vision <laughs> as well. But uh, yeah, overall, good, good World 100, good uh, high limit race this weekend. High limits back in action on Friday, I believe, at Lernerville. Looking ahead to this weekend, though, we have the NASCAR Xfinity and Cup Series in action at Watkins Glen. Xfinity on Saturday, Cup on Sunday. Will Shane Van Gisbergen get his fourth road course win in a row? I think he's in a good spot to do it. But Watkins Glen is a much different racetrack than the other ones that he's won at this year. It's not not as technical. It is a lot faster. Be interested to see how he does there. Expect him to be incredibly good once again. I mean, Marcus Ambrose was lights out at Watkins Glen, so I expect nothing less out of Shane Van Gisbergen. The cup race on Sunday. Hendrick Motorsports has not lost at um, 
Watkins Glenn since 2017, 2018, 2019, Chase Elliott, 21, 22, Kyle Larson, 23, William Byron. Will he continue the trend and win in 24 and pick up, you know, back to back, back to back, back to back for Hendrick Motorsports? Uh, Would be interesting when before Chase Elliott won in 2018, the last time Hendrick Motorsports won at Watkins Glen was 2001 with Jeff Gordon. And now they can't lose there. Um, Byron could use a win in the worst possible way right now. On Sunday morning, we have the Formula One Azerbaijan Grand Prix, Grand Prix, Grand Prix, Grand Prix from Baku. It feels like that race is either super boring or absolutely batshit crazy, and there's no in between for it. This year, you have a much more competitive field than we normally have. So it could be a pretty interesting race. Super long front stretch, the castle section, some narrow uh, corners. Obviously, Kevin Magnuson has to serve as one race. Uh, ban. So Ali Behrman will be in the car for uh, Haas replacing Magnussen for this race because he got too many incident points. But it should be a pretty decent race. And Max hasn't won in like six races now, which is certainly not a bad thing. And then also on Sunday afternoon, you had the IndyCar Championship finale from the Nashville Super Speedway. That race was originally supposed to be on the streets of Nashville, the Titan Stadium being built messed everything up so they moved it to you know the nashville super speedway which is like a solid 40 minutes outside of nashville but hey screw it we're going to keep calling it the uh, nashville super speedway interested to see how that goes there are two different tire compounds that will be used this weekend um which isn't they trialed this last year at gateway on an oval it was eh, okay be interested to see how it works this weekend the tire test there led to a decent number of tire failures based on what was reported uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Alex Pillow is sitting in a good position as long as he doesn't have anything bad happen to him at the beginning of the race. Um, Will Power in second. Scott McLaughlin still technically alive in the championship, um, but uh, Alex Pillow would have to not start the race, which doesn't feel like that's going to happen as much as Scott wants to try to feed him bad sushi as he teased on social. So we we'll have a lot of racing to watch uh, this weekend. Also, on Tuesday, expect an announcement where Kyle Larson, Hendrick Motorsports, and Aaron McLaren will announce that he is running the Indianapolis 500 once again in 2025 to try the double once more. Maybe he'll actually be able to get it done this time and it won't rain in Indianapolis and get too humid down in Charlotte. So let me know what you think about the show. Leave me your voicemails for next week. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Break Hard Blog.